In the years I've been working in the housing industry in Toronto, there's this painful stage, which is listening to NIMBY's complaint. And they make the same arguments again and again, and the vast majority of them are not legit. And I will address them in a moment. But we hear the same arguments again and again, not because they are true or these are problems that need to be fixed, but because we gave them the cultural justifications that it's going to work for them. So here are eight arguments NIMBYs use and the professional explanation why they are not relevant or legit. And I'll start with the easy ones and get into the hardcore ones. Number one, why so tall? Why it can just be three to four stories building? If this is a mid-rise or a tall building site, it won't be built as a three-story building. Almost every open house, I hear this question, why so tall? Why condo? So here's an opportunity to address another thing. Condo is just a type of ownership and it's the opposite of rental, not the opposite of low rise. Okay, but back to our point. In Toronto's official plan, there's the land use map. It is one of the tools that directs growth. There are two main areas there, the mixed use area and apartment neighborhoods, pink and orange in the land use map. These are the areas where the city directs growth in the forms of mid-rise and tall buildings. Why the government doesn't build market housing or why it has to be the private sector and for profit. It's another version of this question. It is not the public's best interest if the government would build housing. And usually what I say is that you don't want your tax money to pay for housing because the government would have had to increase it by a lot. What is being built and should be built by the government is the deeply affordable housing like shelters. But partnerships between the government and the private sector could be a great catalyst to build and get more housing built. But it's better to keep housing, market housing in the hands of the private sector because they would do it just faster and more efficient. A condo slash apartment building will bring the value of my property down. Okay, so this is a classic argument that has been proven to be false time and time again. I encourage you to just literally Google that question. But before I even defend new developments, the value of properties in Toronto have grown so substantially in the last decades that this argument, especially if you, let's say, are a homeowner that and you bought your house somewhere in the 80s, the value has grown dramatically since then that this statement is, is almost ridiculous ridiculous on its own. But let's say for the sake of this argument that they're referring to the same relevant area as if there was no new development in it. Usually developments improve the area they are in with more retail and amenities and even community benefits and parkland dedication that are part of the mechanism of any development approvals. So you see, even these improvements are built into the process of getting new development approved. And also let's address the elephant in the room with that statement. The subtext of it is that the fear of accepting people that are different from them into their neighborhood. And as a rapidly growing city like Toronto, we just cannot afford to think and say things like that. Next one, it will block my view. So you don't own the view from your house and sometimes it sucks, but welcome to living in a big world-class city. The village-like feeling of my neighborhood will change. So Toronto is not a village, and if you want to live in a village, 95.3% of Canada is rural. The infrastructure can't handle it. Okay, this is one of my favorites because now it's not me, it's the pipes that can't handle new development. So these decisions are actually one of the few that are not political, but purely professional. And there are many steps in the way where these aspects are reviewed and considered. And I never heard of a project that the engineering department recommended against it, but council approved it anyway. These things just don't happen. So no need to worry about the city's infrastructure. It's not appropriate to the context. In this case, I say maybe the context is not appropriate to the location, because if we cannot build mid-rise or tall buildings next to, let's say, a new subway station that cost us, what, $24 billion is the recent number? So there's a problem with the context if this is what prevents us from building it. 
And the best one, shadows, the king of arguments. And why? Because unlike the previous seven, this one is tangible. Not only that you can see it, you can measure it. Now, I don't have a problem with that discussion when it comes to the public realm, the sidewalks or parks, but I do have a problem when it gets to private backyards because then it sends the wrong message that we prioritize backyards over housing. And remember, in the winter months, even low-rise, a two-story house would cast a very long shadow. And also, the shadow excuse is mostly against tall buildings, but it's kind of ridiculous because a tall building casts a fast-moving shadow. And this is the perfect example of an excuse that we, as the industry, our planning framework gave the legitimacy to use, but without actually being rooted in reality. These were eight arguments we hear from NIMBYs all the time and the professional explanations why they are not relevant or legit. Thanks for watching.